thank you, Alison. Thank you for all those who have been praying and are continuing to pray for, for Valerie and I and our family. And I just continue to pray that everything goes well. I want to say a special thank you to those who were listed on the prayer sheet, kind of what we're calling our, our standalone ministries. Aha, there it is. We have our Bridges representatives, Jerry and Jody. We have our librarian, Jerry Smuda. We have our groundskeepers, Gene and Barb. We have uh, Barry as our trustee and our decorating committee with Lynn as the head of it and her helpers, Paul and Jan, Marianne, Jean and Barb and Ward and Judy. So we appreciate everything that you do. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, probably haven't seen these signs for a while, but if for a while when you crisscross the country, you might find a billboard that said something like this, Sunday is God's Sabbath. Sunday worship equals the mark of the beast. You ever seen a billboard like that? It's probably been 15 or 20 years. They, they kind of dotted uh, parts of the country for a while, but uh, maybe decided that wasn't the best way to appeal to people. However, I am a little sad that the phone number is blotted out because apparently if you called the number, the Antichrist was going to be revealed, and that would have been really nice to know. But... Um, <laughs> Anyway, we are going to talk about the fourth commandment, and it talks about the Sabbath. And one of the big questions then is, is the Sabbath for today? We are in Exodus 28 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see in all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And then, same commandment in Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15, as Israel is getting ready to, be, uh, to go into the promised land, we have the restatement of the commandments. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant, or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you, to keep the Sabbath day. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your word and you have given us your law. We pray, though, that we would understand how we apply the law that you gave to Israel to us today and what we should do about it, how we should live our lives according to it. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, if there is anyone here that is struggling to know you or struggling to know Jesus and struggling to know your rest, that through the power of your Spirit and the power of your Word, they will enter into your rest today. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. So what is the meaning of the commandment then, the, the commandment for remembering the Sabbath day? Well, first of all, primarily, it is a day of rest. It was a day that they were not supposed to do anything else. It is also called, according to uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy, a day that is holy. And that goes along with a day of rest, a day that is separate from all of the other days, because holy literally means to be set apart, to be different, maybe even set apart for a purpose or a sacred purpose, as the Sabbath day was. Um, it was also a day to commemorate creation. Remember that God rested, and he is our example that we should rest. It was a day to celebrate freedom. They, were, they didn't have to work all of the time. They had an opportunity to rest, to take some time off. And it was a day to remember salvation, a day to commemorate them being freed from slaves and being brought out of Egypt. So all of this is tied up into the Sabbath day. And this is one of the interesting commandments in that it's a, a little different in Exodus and Deuteronomy because there are multiple reasons given. And you have a fleshed out version of the Sabbath day by comparing and contrasting the two. 
You, you have the creation aspect. You have the not slaves aspect. You have the fact that God brought them out of Egypt. All of this is a reminder that this is a special day, a separate day, a holy day, a day of rest. Now, how is the commandment treated in the rest of the Old Testament? Well, as we know from the commandment itself, it is a reminder of God's rest. We find God's rest in Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So the Sabbath day is a reminder of God's rest. And if we're going to try and be like God, then we should rest as well. But it was also a blessing giving, given to Israel. And this is where sometimes the interpretation between the Old and the New Testament becomes a little difficult, trying to understand what might have been specifically for a particular time period or for a particular people. And oftentimes when we look at the law, because we don't keep all of the law, we say, well, there are moral aspects of the law we, we need to keep, but there are some you know, regulations for the nation of Israel and different things. We, we don't have to keep those. So in looking at the Old Testament law, we have to try and figure out, well, what is it saying? What is the main reason behind it? How do we interpret for our day and age today? And some people look at the Sabbath in particular and say, well, it was a blessing given to Israel, and it was given specifically to Israel for a particular period of time. Exodus 16, 29 through 30. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And this had to do with them getting manna in the wilderness. They collected for two days on the sixth day because they weren't supposed to do any work on the seventh, the Sabbath. But it says the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Given you, just them or everyone else? Well, in Ezekiel 20, 12, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now, I'm, I'm kind of giving you a preview of where we're going to end up. But one of the things that is most significant about the Ten Commandments is nine of them are repeated in one way, shape, or form in the New Testament. Nine of them. One is not. Guess which one is not? The Sabbath day that we are supposed to keep it the way we say keep thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not covet. The Sabbath was a symbol of favor and forbidding. What a word, right? But, but it was. It was a, a day of rest, but if they didn't keep it, they were in trouble. Exodus 31, 12 through 17. And the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of, so Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. On the seventh day he was rested and was refreshed. So a sign of favor, but also a sign of forbidding. They were to keep the Sabbath. And it was a time for refrain. It was a time for them to rest. Exodus 35, 1 through 3. Moses assembled all the congregation of the people of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. Six days work shall be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. And you shouldn't surprise you that the Jewish scholars combed through the law to find out what the definition of work was. And there were various things in the Bible that were prohibited to do on the Sabbath day, like building fires, gathering sticks, leaving your place. Prophets later talked about buying and selling or carrying a burden. And what happened was then they took these major categories 
And they made a whole bunch of sub-lists to go with them. And they had a, a highly defined definition of what work was. To the point was when we lived in New York City, uh, if you went to a Jewish hospital on the Sabbath, Saturday, you would find that the elevators were programmed to go up and down and stop on every floor because you couldn't push a button on the Sabbath. So, I mean, very specific as to what was work and what wasn't. And the Sabbath was a time for worship. Now, this is, this is hinted at at the very beginning. Numbers 28, 9 through 10. On the Sabbath day, two male lambs instead of one. Two male lambs a year, without, a year old without blemish and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour for a grain offering mixed with oil and its drink offering. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath besides the regular burnt offering and its drink offering. So you have the regular and then you have the special because it is the Sabbath, because the day is holy, because the day is special. Is it perhaps not just a day of rest, but a day of worship? And then at least it developed into that. I think it was probably a day of rest and worship from the very beginning because in resting you were being like God. You weren't doing other things. What were you supposed to do? One of the things I think you were supposed to do, although it's not mentioned explicitly, is worship. But by the time we get to Psalm 92, 1 through 4, we have a psalm, a song for the Sabbath. And you see it's in bold letters there. Some say, well, these introductions to the psalms weren't a part of the text. Well, baloney. They're in all of the texts that we have of the Hebrew Bible. So there's every good chance when the psalms were written down, these were a part of them. And this shows us that at some point in time, maybe right from the very beginning, the Sabbath was considered a day of worship, a psalm, a song for the Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Well, what is that but worship? Worship on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was to be a time for joy. Not only do we read that in Psalm 92, but we also see that in Isaiah 58, 13, and 14. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, meaning not doing any work on it, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I'll make you ride on the heights of the earth. The Sabbath was to be a time for joy, a time of worship, a time of celebration. So that's, that's how the commandment for the Sabbath was viewed in the entirety of the Old Testament. It was a time of joy, a time for worship, a time for refrain. It was a symbol of favor and forbidding and a blessing given to Israel, as well as a reminder of God's rest. Well, how do we see the commandment in the New Testament? Understanding, as I've already let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, there it went, no. <laughs> that it's not really repeated this way in the New Testament. Well, let's talk about Jesus' teaching concerning the Sabbath, because I think it sets the stage for our understanding of it. And there are a couple of things that we find in the Gospels he does with the Sabbath. And he kind of confronts the religious leadership about the way they've been observing it at the very least. First of all, he shows us that mercy is more important than legalism. Because they were very legalistic. We talked about so many restrictions. And they took the general categories they get from the Old Testament, make a whole bunch of other regulations. And you had to keep them all. And if you did any of them, then you were guilty before God. Well, Jesus says mercy is more important than legalism. Matthew 12, 9 through 13. He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So they might accuse him. He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand, and the man stretched it out, and it was restored healthy like the other. Jesus said, mercy is more important than legalism on the Sabbath. It's okay to rest, but you can't ignore that other people might need help. And he also taught that mercy is a priority under the law. A priority. 
John 7, 21 through 24. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but the, from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. And what he was saying there is it's actually older than Moses because it was done by the fathers. Ultimately, it comes from God. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And here Jesus is saying, you know what? There are laws that come in conflict with one another, like the law of circumcision and the law of keeping the Sabbath. Well, you decide then that, okay, it's okay to circumcise on the Sabbath. You're making a priority of one law over the other. I'm telling you it's always a priority to make, it's always uh, um, important to make mercy a priority even on the Sabbath. So I was right to heal on the Sabbath, even by your limited understanding, he's basically saying. He also points out that the Sabbath was supposed to be a blessing. And we talked about this from the Old Testament in general, that it was a joy. It was supposed to be a joy to celebrate the Sabbath. They, they've made it a bunch of rules. He said it's supposed to be a blessing. Mark 2, 23 through 27. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. Big no-no, that's work. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, what are they, what are they doing why? Oh, goodness. Lord, look, what are, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Eventually I'll get it out. Give me enough t- tries and I can read. And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Here he said, well, David did something that was wrong. He did it on the Sabbath. He's actually praised for it. Are you saying that he was wrong to do that? To to actually do what was unlawful, according to you? He reminds them that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And I think this is him saying it was supposed, the Sabbath is supposed to be a joy and a blessing. And by allowing people to go hungry just because of the Sabbath, that's not right. That's not right. And Jesus goes on in Mark 3.28 to really say that he has the ability, the right, the authority to correct the understanding of the Sabbath. Completely. Totally. Because the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And who is the Son of Man? Well, it's Jesus Christ himself. He's saying, I have every right to confront you, to challenge you, to change your perspective, to change your understanding, to help you to get it, because the way you are interpreting the Sabbath law in the first place is completely and totally wrong. You celebrate legalism. You put burdens on the back of people that they can't bear regarding keeping the Sabbath. You have all these laws and regulations You don't think about mercy. You don't think about blessing. And his kind of beginning to break up their understanding of the Sabbath kind of sets the stage for what we find in the rest of the New Testament because we find that the Sabbath is not obligatory. And, I mean, we should understand some of this on an intellectual and emotional level anyway because we're not actually worshiping on the Sabbath because the Sabbath is Saturday. We're worshiping on a Sunday. Uh, Now, some want to say, well, gosh, if we're worshiping on a Sunday, well, that's okay because of what Jesus did, which we'll talk about in a moment, but we still should keep all of those other aspects of the Sabbath. But I, I don't think that's what we find in the New Testament And we find this in Romans 14, 5, and 6. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. So here, here, Paul's basically saying some people look at the Sabbath, some don't, some worship on Sunday, some might worship another day, some still adhere to all the feasts and festival days, that's okay, because there's not a law about it anymore. You just have to make sure 
that what you're doing is right in God's sight and you're truly worshiping him. You do it to honor him, whatever you end up doing. And we read this in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Saying these things point to Jesus Christ. The festivals, the feast days, even the Sabbath, they point to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has come. That's why we don't have to observe the Sabbath anymore as this one particular day where you do absolutely no work and you worship. You could do it another day. It doesn't have to be the way it's always been. Been. And what's most interesting is when Paul is writing particularly here in Colossians, there, there appears to be a, um, a Jewish force in the church. They called them Judaizers. And what they said is, okay, you want to believe in Jesus Christ, that's fine, but you have to keep everything in the law too. And Paul says over and over again, remember what my cry from Galatians was? Jesus is what? Enough. Jesus is enough. It's not Jesus and. It's not Jesus plus. It's Jesus, period. That's it. And keeping the Sabbath isn't a part of worshiping God anymore in the sense that the Jewish people did it. So what is the commandment for us today? And I think it's important for us to understand that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. This is the way that the... the, Uh, early church looked at it. This is the way the reformers looked at it. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. We read in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. When we read the Old Testament, we do it through the lens of Jesus Christ. What is this telling us about Jesus Christ? And the Sabbath tells us a whole lot about Jesus Christ. Because the Sabbath is about grace. The Sabbath is about mercy. The Sabbath is about joy. The Sabbath is about compassion. The Sabbath is about rest. I mean, think about all of the reasons it was there. They, they weren't seen as slaves. They were to be like God. They were able to rest. It all has to do with compassion and mercy. And this is all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Because what happens in Jesus Christ, we rest from our spiritual work because Jesus Christ did everything he needed to do to accomplish our salvation when he died on the cross for our sins. That's why we read in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The author of Hebrews looks at Jesus Christ and talks about how the fact that was that the you know, Israelites were supposed to enter into rest, but there was a Sabbath rest still available for the people of God because they did not enter into it the way that they were supposed to. And that, that Sabbath rest is belief in Jesus Christ. And we, we can't work our way to heaven. That's the reminder. We can't. We have to believe in Jesus. We have to understand that we've all sinned. We've all done wrong in God's sight. No amount of good we can do can make up for even the smallest sin because the smallest sin is an affront to God. Something has to be done to pay the price for our sins, and that something is someone, and that someone is Jesus Christ. Second person of the divine trinity. Left heaven, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, became the perfect sacrifice when he died on the cross for our sins. He died in our place. He took the punishment we deserved upon himself. He made it possible for us to be forgiven. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Our faith in him is what saves us, not what we do. He is our rest. And when we believe, we enter into that rest. And I think this helps us to make some sense of what Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We enter into God's rest when we believe in Jesus Christ. Now the things that we do, we aren't trying to do to work our way to heaven. We're simply doing them because of the joy we feel for the, for, because of the fact that we have entered into heaven. In a sense, we are going to enter into heaven. 
We are saved, we are his, and we do what he wants us to do because we love him. So Jesus is our Sabbath rest, but we still worship, right? It's not that worship has been done away with too if we don't have the Sabbath anymore. We still worship. And what we're told to worship, first of all, privately. I mean, we're told we should have personal devotions, Matthew 6.6, 6, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. There, we should be doing something regularly, I, daily, maybe multiple times a day. It's one of the reasons I, I do the blog, and we're going through the Bible now, and, and someone came to me this morning and said, I'm going to be so happy when we're through with Job. I understand that. Just, just wait till we get in the middle of Deut- Deuteronomy and Leviticus. I mean, come on. It, it, it's still going to be a little bit of a slog, but it's an important slog because there are lessons for us to learn there. And when we look at it and we, we go through it and we try and you know, dive into it to, to understand the lessons, that what's, that's what helps us to grow. So we're, we're supposed to worship privately, personal study, um, uh, public, uh, prayer, maybe even singing, whatever it is. And we're supposed to Worship publicly. Acts 2.42, the early church, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bed and prayers. This is the idea. They got together. They engaged in the Lord's Supper. They, they listened to a teaching or a sermon. They prayed. They did all the things that we think of as a normal public worship experience today. 1 Timothy 4.13, this was advice to a young pastor, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. There's singing. And then finally, the, the magnum opus of public worship, Hebrews 10.24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Come together to encourage one another, to help one another, to live for God. And that's a reminder, I think, that worship is not only private, it's not only public, but it's perpetual as well. And it's too bad Ken Hollenbeck isn't here. He would have loved those three points, the alliteration there. But perpetually, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the idea you lay your life on the altar every day. And it's not for salvation. It's just your reasonable act of worship and service to a God who has loved you enough to die on the cross for your sins. Private worship, public worship, perpetual worship, devoting your life. You know, the, the priests were a special class in the Old Testament. We're all priests now. We're all priests. We have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus Christ has done. We are to serve him with our lives, and we do that because he has given us rest. We no longer have to wonder or worry if we're worthy. We're not. No surprise, we're not. But Jesus Christ is. And Jesus Christ is the one who died for us. We rest in that. It's no longer about, will I get to heaven? Can I get to heaven? Can I do enough to get to heaven? No, Jesus is our rest. So now, we rest in Him and we worship with every moment of our lives. We, we live for Him. We love Him. We, we sing to Him. We pray to Him. We worship together publicly as a response to Him. We learn about him. It's all about Jesus. Because without him, we would be nothing. And then, because it's all about Jesus, and Jesus is our rest that we enter into, Sunday is an appropriate day for corporate worship. Appropriate day. I think that's the best way to put it. 
It's an appropriate day for gathering together to worship. And some people can even make it a day of rest if they can. Others can't. But Sunday's appropriate because of what? Well, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Luke 24, 1, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they prepared. And what did they find? The tomb was empty. Empty. We commemorate the resurrection when we worship on Sunday. Acts 27, on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bed, Paul talked with them intending to depart on the next day, but he prolonged his speech until midnight. And if I'm remembering correctly, this is the funny story, the guy falls asleep in the window and falls out and splats on the pavement and dies. And Paul comes and says, uh, well, basically he brings him back to life to the power of God. But, but here's the thing, on the first day of the week, again, and then we just went through Revelation. Remember at the beginning of Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And some will say, well, the Lord's day refers to that eschatological day in the future that we're all waiting for. Um, but the, the simple reading and understanding of this verse is, he was in the Spirit, worshiping on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, and then this magnificent thing happened to him. It wasn't already happening. He was doing what he does every Sunday. And that's why we look at the New Testament and we say, well, Sunday is an appropriate day to worship because we commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why it's called the Lord's Day. It commemorates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not Saturday, but Sunday. Not with all the legalism and all the mess that became a part of Jewish tradition, but a day of worship, a day of blessing, a day of praise, a day that is special and isn't special. It's special because there is always something special about gathering together with believers to worship God. But a day that isn't special because worship is something that is not just confined to one moment of one day a week. Worship is something that we are supposed to not only do publicly, but privately, and beyond that, perpetually. So special, sure, but not quite so special as we might first think, simply because this is a reminder that God is our priority, that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our King, and He is our Sabbath rest. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for your word and this reminder that um, it's all about you, it's all about Jesus, and a reminder that even the Sabbath that was given to Israel pointed to the rest that we have in Jesus Christ. Help us to rest in him, Lord. Help us to understand that it's not about us, it's about you. And what we do now is in response to your love and your grace and your mercy. Help every day to be a day of rest in that way, Lord. Because we, we, we sometimes are harder on ourselves than we need to be. I suppose the equal is true. Sometimes we're not hard enough. But we have to realize that in the midst of this all, you're on our side. You're rooting for us. You're working in our lives to the power of your Spirit. You've given us everything we need for life and godliness. We have to just rest in you. Help us to rest in you, Lord. Help us not be overcome by dread and guilt all the time, but to understand the joy that comes with, with mercy and grace and compassion, the joy that comes from having a relationship with you through Jesus Christ, the joy that comes from recognizing him as our Sabbath rest. The joy that comes from grace, Lord, help us to rest in the joy that comes from grace. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.